the live without sticking it. Good afternoon. Uh, my computer is now telling me that this meeting is streaming live. So uh, welcome to our, uh, our online planning forum this afternoon. Um, I'm going to begin this meeting. Uh, sorry, Michael Berkman is my name. I'm the Greens MP for the seat of Maywa in Queensland State Parliament. I want to begin the meeting by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. And obviously with a remote meeting like this, that may well Maywa. be traditional owners all over the state or the country. Um, but here where I am, it's the Yagara and the Turrbal people. And I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging um, and acknowledge that this land, the sovereignty over this land was never ceded. So um, I'm here on, on Aboriginal country. Um, look, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, obviously, um, we've, we've come a long way in the last few months in terms of uh, getting better at uh, dealing with um, the COVID crisis. We've also seen extraordinary health results. So hopefully we won't have to continue to do everything online for too much longer. Um, but uh, I'd love to have a face-to-face -face event on this today, but it's, uh, it's great that we're able to meet online and address um, what is a really important issue um, in, in the electorate of Maywa. Um, before I dive straight into the purpose of today and we get started, I just I also want to acknowledge as well that uh, right at, at the moment, um, there's a refugee day of action that's started. So we're, it's, it's going on concurrently. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that and show my support for all those folks who have turned up at that event. And I guess acknowledge that I would probably be there where I'm not hosting this, um, but it's, that's not to say I'm not really grateful to be here. Now, uh, today, what is it all about? What's, what's the point of this forum? Well, I suppose in a nutshell, uh, I've been in this role for two and a half years and and since even before I was elected, it was absolutely clear that um, development and planning issues were some of the most important um, around each and every one of the suburbs in Maywa. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm assuming most people tuning in would be aware that council is largely responsible for much of the implementation and, and decision making around planning. Um, but I do spend a lot of my time as a state MP dealing with planning issues and advocating on the community's behalf around development matters. But perhaps more importantly, um, council, when it's, when it's dealing with the planning system, it's doing so under a state, uh, state legislative framework. So um, it's, it's necessarily, um, when we talk about planning, it necessarily involves uh, local governments and the state government. Um, and... From my experience in this role, I think, it, broadly speaking, I can say that the, the current system is in a lot of ways letting the community down and it isn't serving the interests of, of people or communities first and foremost. So to that end, I have, um, as an MP and as a candidate before that, been calling for some really quite significant um, reform of the planning system. And so I guess today I've... Um, called in the cavalry. We've got some, some great experts here to talk about um, the issues in the electorate and, uh, and I guess put a bit of a framework around um, what planning looks like at the moment, um, what are the main issues with the system as it stands and what do we want it to look like? What could this system be and how could it better serve the community and lead to more sustainable and more appropriate development outcomes? Um, so the format, um, uh, I suppose, um, just by way of background, my, I've, I've got a bit of experience in this. Before I was elected as an MP, I, um, I worked as a planning and environment lawyer. I certainly um, can't claim to be an expert in planning because much of the work I did in the five years prior to my election was in the environmental law space. So working in the community sector as a lawyer, helping locals, um, you know, help, helping communities use the law to protect their interests and the environment. Um, not so much of that was planning, but in a past life before that, I have done planning work, but I'm certainly not an expert, which is why we've got three amazing experts on the panel to, to help flesh out these issues and bring their experience, their expertise and their insights. Um, and so we are very privileged today to have, uh, to have three experts with us and oh, I, I've not included your bio, so I'm just going to have to like give rough intros off the top of my head. Um, Elizabeth Handley is uh, someone who's probably known to a lot of locals. She's been involved in countless community groups over the years, um, perhaps most notably in this part of the world, Parkit um, was something that Elizabeth did a lot of work on. 
Uh, and yeah, um, I'll, Fruit Park, I guess, is another one of the really amazing campaigns um, in addition to, to Park It being, um, being focused on the use of the ABC site. Um, so Elizabeth is the chair of Park It. Um, Howard Briggs is another Maywa local who is uh, a retired planner, but someone with extraordinary experience in this space and um, will get in discussion to, uh, to kind of reflect on some of the key reforms over a lot of years. And Howard was involved in many of those going back a couple of decades. He was quite integral to one of the really major shifts in the planning system in Queensland um, 23 years ago now, uh, if my maths is right. Um, and uh, Sophie Personato, who's uh, a, a recent graduate of town in town planning, um, and someone who I guess brings that um, the kind of uh, fresh ac academic perspective and um, you know the current current thinking around planning um, as it's taught. Now uh, that was a longer intro than I had planned to give, but I'll. Um, uh, basically, I'll give my um, my take on the current state of play, and then each of those speakers will, in turn, um, address address what they consider to be some of the biggest issues in planning and development around Maywara and in, within the broader system. Um, and then we'll move on to questions. So we've got some questions that have been provided in advance, but I, if I understand the tech properly, this is streaming on both Facebook and on YouTube. So. If you're watching and you have a question, please pop it in the comments box on either of those platforms uh, and that'll come through to us. So uh, we'd love to take your questions in real time. If I can ask you though, uh, include, uh, your name will be there, but just include your suburb or city or where you're from so that um, we've got a bit more context. It feels a bit more personal rather than just being all remote. Um, uh, so, so, okay, this is, where, this is where we actually start the chat, I suppose. Um, there are a bunch of recurring themes, I suppose. This is the way I wanted to approach this. We're seeing certain themes that come back time and again, and these are issues that um, locals in their experience, whether it's um, development on their street or in the broader neighbourhood or across the state, um, there are certain features of the planning system that appear to be letting people down. And we do see it time and time again. So I guess I wanted to step through some of those themes. Um, the first of those is that I think the system um, is one that really does require more meaningful public input. And a, a, really, um, a really classic example of that and a, a fairly current one was the zipline proposal up at Mount Cooper. And um, we, we heard the Lord Mayor at the time quite explicitly say that the three and a half thousand odd submissions that were received on that project wouldn't necessarily affect the outcome. So when we've got um, you know, political leaders who can quite explicitly um, dismiss that kind of community input? I guess that's that's you know alarm bells start ringing for me about um, the utility of it and and what that means for the system. Um, and this is manifested as well in the fact that there's really extensive code accessible um, uh, code assessment in under this system at the moment, which means that really substantial um, residential or commercial um, construction, development can be approved without there being a formal community consultation mechanism. Um, there's also, I suppose it's worth mentioning that there are some, um, some parallel processes that aren't so much council driven, like the, uh, the process of infrastructure designation, which, um, which is the state minister making decisions about what, uh, what development looks like, usually for community infrastructure like, um, like schools. I mean, those are, those are the examples that we've dealt with most recently here in Maywa. So um, the community consultation for the infrastructure designations at the Queensland Academy of Science, Maths and Technology, the old um, Tuong College uh, and at St. Peter's, they've, there have been you know, these few examples in the electorate lately where they, they're kind of rushed processes they're a bit scant on detail sometimes and where the community certainly in some cases come out of the consultation process feeling like they haven't been heard. Um, there's also an issue where when, you know, some, some wins where there is a community win, it's actually not so much a win through the planning system, but by political means. And again, I've got a, a classic example of that, which is the TRICARE proposal um, at Turinga. The community was quite rightly up in arms about the proposal um, for this massive aged care facility that was completely inconsistent with the surrounding neighbourhood. Um, 
far beyond the three levels that um, even the councillor at the time said was appropriate for the area. Um, so the community rose up, they made their voices heard, council refused it, but then the planning system allows the developer to appeal that in court and ultimately it's approved by the court. So even if you get that political win and through the decision-making avenues, you see a proposal knocked off, the planning system as it stands still, uh, it, it leaves that scope for, um, for a development to be approved, even if it's politically unpalatable, it's inappropriate for the area or, or terribly unsustainable. Um, now, I think uh, from my discussions with locals, everyone accepts that this is a part of the world where we will see um, an increase in, in, you know, in density, but the population is going to grow here. We have some excellent transport infrastructure, particularly if you look at the train line. So there are some, some natural um, you know, transport nodes along there where you would expect there to be an intensification of, uh, of development. But it's so important that, um, and this is the issue, is that we have seen a, a shortfall in community infrastructure to keep up with that pace of development. And that includes all manner of community infrastructure, whether it's green space or, or transport, um, you know, schools, hospitals, the whole gamut. Um, and a, a, a cracking example locally, and I'm sure, I don't know if Elizabeth is gonna to go to this, but the ABC site is a really excellent example. We've, um, we've got a lot of development going up in Tawang and, and quite rightly so uh, to some extent, we can debate about the, um, the exact extent of what that development should be. But, um, but as we see more people move into the area, we need green space. People living in apartments need that green space outside um, because we have families increasingly living in units, even though that may not have traditionally been the norm. Um, so look, I guess when you, when you boil it all down, we've got a system that is in a lot of ways, I would suggest, and this is me, you know, not putting on my, you know, my planning hat, but my political hat. Um, we have a system that is quite fundamentally stacked and has over time become more and more favorable for developers interests at the extent of, uh, at the expense of community interests. Um, and, and, you know, when we talk about developers' interests, that's fundamentally about their bottom line. It's about profits. Um, so we, there is, you know, another, I guess, a recent example to point to is the, um, the Aura retire, Retirement Village proposal at Long Pocket, where, you know, this is land that um, uh, was, was acquired by the Indrapilly Golf Club for very, very little um, some time ago and has, in fact, now... Um, you know, development's been approved there with some inconsistencies with council's um, zoning, and it, the, you know, the the uh, the leaseholder of this land, the golf club, and the developer stand to make an absolute mint out of it. Um, when in fact we could see better community outcomes with that sort of land. Um, I don't want to go on uh, at too much more length, but I guess I want to just flag a few other current issues. So within those themes, um, there are some current issues around Maywa that I'm very mindful of and that we've had plenty of people getting in touch with us about. Um, so just to put these on your radar, if you have specific questions about these, um, these proposals, by all means, um, shoot them through. These may be issues that the speakers will deal with later on, um, but We've got, uh, for example, this is one where we've, my office has been doing some consultation directly um, to find out what the community thinks. The, the old Woolies site in Tawong, um, obviously that has been waiting for a very long time for some revitalization. And we've seen a couple of different proposals come through and um, the most recent one is a code accessible development. So this is why I've asked the community, we've put out a survey recently asking for your views so that I in this role can amplify those views, whether or not there's a role within the assessment process for formal community consultation. Um, there's uh, the, the pontoon at St Lucia at 160 Macquarie Street. There's been a bit of media about this lately. It's, uh, it's one that extends an extraordinarily long way into the river, um, puts at risk that, that kind of transport passage um, for both rowers and for city cats, for example, creates a bit of a safety risk. Um, there's the proposal on the corner of Swan Road and Mogul Road. There's this new Coles, which is popping up on that bit of vacant land that everyone's been, uh, been eyeing off for years, wondering uh, what might ultimately come of it. Um, and I understand, uh, this is actually, so I didn't mention at the outset that uh, Sophie's been doing some fantastic volunteering work uh, in the office and she found this little, 
you know, little nugget of information that this is a site that's supposed to be of particular significance, citywide significance, uh, and yet we've somehow ended up with a uh, with a Coles and a liquor land being proposed to go up there. So anyway, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, uh, the Atira building in Tawong. Now, this is uh, contentious for a variety of reasons, I suppose, but it was when initially proposed as a 15 storey student accommodation. Uh, it was one that raised some eyebrows right right back at that early stage. Um, I guess the situation we're in now is that uh, the, the developer had a specific change made to the development approval um, so that it was specifically supposed to be for student accommodation. And that was actually, as I understand it, a mechanism for the developer to get really significant discounts on the, the charges that they pay for, for infrastructure, the, you know, the money they pay to council to, um, to provide that supporting infrastructure that is so, so desperately needed when big development goes up. Um, and now with this state government decision to put at-risk people in this accommodation for the, you know, the, temporary, um, the temporary accommodations there, there's a real clash between the approval, um, the fact that the infrastructure charges uh, weren't paid and the infrastructure is maybe not up to scratch and the current use. So um, there's, a, there's a real tension there. There are obviously other political and um, you know, public health issues at play, but there's a really important planning tension too. Um, one last example I'm going to point to is uh, relates to this infrastructure designation at the, the Queensland Academy of Science, Maths and Technology. Um, you know, the, the green space around that school uh, and the school grounds themselves is so integral to the community and its connectivity. Um, and yet we've seen the infrastructure designation didn't really properly recognise that. And there was, a, there was a real concern that the community might lose use of this green space. Um, so it was a huge win, a great outcome to see the community get access back to that. But um, we should see these sorts of approvals actually ensuring access to that green space in the first place. Uh, look, I think that is well and truly enough from me. Um, thank you for your patience while I got through my probably too long list of issues uh, to discuss. But look, I'll throw now to Elizabeth Handley. Um, so the plan is I think we're going to do about 10 minutes each from this point, and then we'll move on to the Q&A. So um, over to you, Elizabeth. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Handley, and I'm a community advocate. Uh, my interest in planning and its issues began about 21 years ago with the Victoria Golf Club and expanded with the proposed development of the Milton Tennis Court site. At present, I'm involved in the proposed redevelopment of the ABC site. This site was promised to the community many years ago as public green space, but when the time came, it was sold to, the, to a developer. With the massive amount of high-rise development in Tawong, it is more important than ever that this site is turned into green space. Why should you be interested in planning? Planning is about life, ensuring the necessities are provided as well as building healthy and happy communities. It means taking into account the placement of a whole range of things we need, including heavy and light industry, shopping centres, offices, transport, schools and community facilities. To provide them in such a way that our communities are enhanced. To insist that amenity is essential if you want prosperous communities. Decisions made now impact on societies for decades. We owe it to future generations to try and get it right now. Planning happens on all three levels of government, but an unfair proportion of the cost falls at the local government level. We have a Commonwealth government that sets our immigration policy, a state government that writes our planning, housing and state and local governance legislation, and a local government that creates town plans and policies that are approved by state government. How those plans are interpreted is done by local government. We are supposed to have a legal system that ensures that this system is fair, but it, it is becoming increasingly expensive and is very much weighted in favour of the developer. All of this in the main is paid by you. And yet you as the community are purposefully excluded from making meaningful and enforceable comment. When things go wrong, 
each level of government blames the other. We do not need a blame game. We need these people to be acted in coordinated, considered, transparent manner that ensures the best outcomes for the community. This is what we are paying for. The Planning Act 2016 says it is, pro it is providing for an efficient, effective, transparent, integrated, coordinated and accountable system of land use planning and development assessment to facilitate the achievement of ecological sustainability. Nowhere does it mention maximising short-term developer profit. The word community appears 16 times and only once does it talk about community consultation. Amenity appears twice, but there is no definition of its meaning. Consultation appears no time, nine times, sorry. Nowhere in the Act is it specified how that consultation is to be conducted, how it is to be listened to and acted upon. This Act specialises in out clauses and ways around the legislation. Do you know why? The Act was written with virtually no community consultation. Extensive consultation was undertaken with the development and the construction industry and local government but very limited consultation was undertaken with the employers of government. That is the community, the ratepayer, the taxpayer, the resident, who all bear the cost of these decisions, but are allowed some sort of input only under very limited circumstances. You are told that you have the options of making a submission at the neighbourhood planning stage. West End put in over 5,000 submissions against their neighbourhood plan and it went ahead anyway. No explanation was provided to the community as to why their input was ignored. Was there essential information that was not provided to them? Is that community consultation or a tick the box exercise? The increased use of code accessible development has led to a myriad of totally inappropriate developments and communities that live will live with these poor planning decisions for many years to come. A community should be enriched by planning, not diminished by it. Planning should look to future requirements and be aware of the opportunity costs when decisions are made. Yet by law, communities have no right to make submissions about these developments or to make a legal appeal against them. To make matters worse, we are told that the council will make conditions that will mitigate the worst features of these developments. And yet very rarely are these conditions checked with the completed development to ensure that it complies with the development approval. Indeed, our council would spend more on marketing their achievements to us as if they had paid for them personally with ratepayer money than they would on ensuring developer compliance. Professionals in town planning and associated industries often move between industry and various levels of government. And this revolving door of influence has unexpectedly and in some cases corrupted effect. It leads to a decrease in transparency and accountability around planning decisions. This whole situation has been exacerbated by the use of private certifiers. Development approvals seem to be made on an ad hoc basis and they do not seem to take into account the cumulative effects of their decisions through the legislation, though, although, sorry, the legislation says they are supposed to. We are developing areas with higher density than Singapore, but with much less attention to good planning. Tuong has more than doubled its population since the 1960s. And in the last five years, almost 4,000 new bedrooms have been added to this area. Yet the parkland and sports and recreation space available has almost halved. It has lost the following sites. The Tuong Bowls Club, a riverfront site on Glen Road, a major part of Moor Park to Land Street and the widening of Coronation Drive in the 70s, the parking space that services the Wesley Hospital from the 1990s, the Duong Library and the Associated Park, 
the Chuang Pool, the Orchid Flower Bowls Club in Bayless Street. High density development is supposed to come with the infrastructure to make it livable. Ask anybody who lives in an apartment whether they want access to neighbourhood green space. Ask all the children living in high rises that whether they would like a place to play. We seem to be specialising in building all shades of oppressive grey and black towers. I hate to state the obvious, but we live in a subtropical climate. How do these fit in? There is very little attempt to meet community expectations and almost nothing about the fitness for purpose of a proposed development. It is not even a planning criteria. If it were, there, would, there is no way we would have the TRICARE building being built into the side of a very steep hill as a supposedly suitable site for an aged care facility. We would have social house, we would not have social housing customers being shoved into totally inappropriate tiny student rooms in giant towers so that now the taxpayer can pay the developer shortfall because they seem to have built uneconomic and dysfunctional buildings. All with no community consultation, large taxpayer cost, and with plans to extend to other areas of Brisbane. Town planning is too important just to be left to those who benefit from it financially next month. Our environment is vital to us, and as such, we should all have a say in what is valued and considered by our governments at all levels. We need to establish what is needed to change. How do we make that change, and who can lead the charge? Thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, really, really do value your insights and experience from many, many years of engaging, um, you know, as one of the most active community members I've certainly had the pleasure of working with, um, both before and since being elected. Um, really great to hear your thoughts. Uh, Howard, Howard Briggs, if you're ready now, I might throw to you. And um, if you're happy, happy to go now, just take it away. I'm happy to speak now. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on the subject. Um, I've got a bit of quite a bit of concern and I've been involved in the area for quite some time. As you mentioned before, um, I have been involved for 23 years. Uh, I was involved in the draft of the Integrated Planning Act. When a number of the problems we now are confronting were in fact started and I was contributed to that, I argued quite strongly to bring about what I thought were appropriate provisions. Um, being in the stage of public servant dealing with uh, land planning issues in the, in the agricultural areas, um, but I was unsuccessful. And a lot of the problems were what we're talking about now. It's about a lack of understanding about what is planning, lack of understanding both at the professional and the community end, and uh, people talking at each other rather than actually coming up with a common uh, view of things. Um, the perception is that the community, all I want to do is prevent things occurring in their area, when in fact the community may have information which is highly relevant to the planner in making a decision. Um, I was involved in uh, making, assisting the people with the, um, uh, the TRICARE development. And what really disappointed me at that time was that um, uh, in 